Gwen Thomas, Ethan Ryman, Shun Shu Li, Roberta Marshall, Elisa Cigitelli, and Jay Pasilla. Group show, Facts of Light. And today we have, uh, we're gonna have a walkthrough with you all. And uh, the primary uh, contestants for that walkthrough are Tim Maw and Roberta Marshall, the curator of the show. Um, guest curator, I should say. So uh, Roberta brought the idea a few months ago after having had a studio visit with Shinji Lee and, and um, realized that there was some um, uh, con connection between their works. So they'll talk more about that. And uh, I just wanted to do, I'm not gonna do much of introductions here, but I just wanted everyone to know who Tim Mall is especially because Tim wrote a review for the Brooklyn Rail, which we loved and adored, which led to this walkthrough. Uh, Tim's very knowledgeable about, say, the period of, say, minimalism, post-minimalism. We're calling this show uh, kind of uh, Baroque minimalism. Um, and Tim will, is very good at like situating the show within historical context, so we're, and also personal context. So we're excited to hear that with Roberta, who's the curator. And <laughs> Roberta had a show in Participant, I guess, six months ago, Participant, um, a solo show. And that's where Shin Shi Li wandered in and uh, said to Roberta, who happened to be there, oh, your work looks a lot like mine. And instead of uh, Roberta throwing Shin Shi Li out of the gallery, uh, embraced Shin Shi and um, did a studio visit and then realized the connections and then came to me with the idea, basically, and we developed it from there. Uh, Tim Maw uh, is a photographer himself, which many of you may know, and has a show coming up in Paris at Gallery Florence Lowy, and is also represented here in New York with by Leslie Tanaka Gallery. Um, Tim is both a photographer and a writer, so situates him perfectly for our situation here. Uh, we like art, art writer practitioners. They have usually the best insights. So I'm gonna turn the camera around now for Roberta and Tim uh, to begin uh, our walkthrough. Tim has seen the show in person, uh, but is not in the gallery at the moment, as you'll notice. Um, and uh, so has a good sense of the space already because the space is important to the show. Okay, take it away. Hi, Tim. Hi, Roberta, good to see you. Good to see you up in, up in Connecticut. So um, yeah, um, sh should I start off by doing a little, a little tour of the show perhaps? Yeah, why don't we, yeah, please yeah. start at the beginning. Well, David you know, was, was talking about how Shinsha came to, uh, you know, he, improve the story a little bit, but we got the gist. Um, and I went to the studio visit with him, I think in July, and I walked in and I saw this little piece in particular here. And in the moment when I saw it, I had this thing of, wait a sec, is that light being reflected off of the piece or um, is that a representation? Of life, um, and that's the kind of ambiguity that um, kind of guided me. Um, I, I mean, kind of almost immediately, I started making some connections. And I also, and uh, you know, it's interesting actually to move the camera maybe a little bit with looking at this piece. It took me a second to realize that it's actually this is not a square. It's a uh, it's a trapezoid. I've been trying to learn the difference between trapezoids and rhomboids since I flunked geometry years ago. <laughs> um, but what he'd done with this piece was that he cut it to how it appeared in perspective, you know, and did it in this really subtle kind of way. And I was like, oh. And it reminded me, are we okay? Because yes. I've never done this walkthrough. So, you know, Mr. Dixon's having to do a lot of interesting choreography. Of um, this work that I've seen recently of Gwen Thomas's um, at a show, I think in um, May or June, sometime at um, 57 West 57 Gallery, where she was also cutting the photograph um, perspectively um, with this emphasis on 
the way that things actually appear and not um, kind of kind of rationalizing it back into the you know a, we oh it, it's a rectangle so we have to portray it as a rectangle um, and that. Um, there's, oh, come over here, there's another piece of Singes that's doing the same thing of cutting the photograph um, to, to how it appears to, to the phenomenological perspectival take on it. And also that there, there's a, it's the light bulb and he's mm. cut it to the shape of the thing. So yeah, that, um, that just kind of was what got me, got me started. But um, your thoughts, sir, should we, should um, I keep going on? No, um, I, what, what struck me about the show, uh, about Gwen Thomas's work, what a woman I think I met maybe in the 70s through an artist named Jean Dupuy, who recently died, um, was that uh, there were some unfashionable things going on with all the work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and my, with my entry into the gallery, which, um, the kind of uh, glass works and plastic work she were she was doing, it it presented um, this. For one thing, I thought of Robert Smithson, who um, a difficult, complicated guy, but my my favorite artist, writer, visionary person. And then I thought of kind of sixty science fiction, but I also thought of um, this kind of proto photography purity of light and purity of experience that um, kind of was really cleansing. And um, it set the tone for the entire choreography of visiting the gallery, of, of walking around with this kind of haptic, um, haptic conductive light that went through this in a very post-minimal object, you know, and um, very portable as is, everything is in the show is very compact, really portable, which doesn't seem that fashionable these days. And, um, and seeing this group of things just set off this kind of flood of memories for me about um, particularly the late 60s and early 70s when I was a student at School of Visual Arts studying under a lot of post-minimalists. And uh, also, um, proto pre-photographic um, experiments in light and, and optics, which I think the other artists really, including yourself kind of, I felt I was walking around a camera obscura or a, a, a large kind of optic machine. And um, the windows of the gallery, which are very beautiful, um, sort of let in this, this light that, um, that everything sort of conducted. So, um, I think we jump in, Tim, if it's okay, because there are people here, I presume we haven't been to the gallery, but to show, mm -hmm. you know, do a little show and tell. Um, mm -hmm. uh, these are made, first of all, I'm going to just maybe for super easy reference, go over to this piece. This, um, these are Gwen Thomas's nuts, and yes, it's more demonstrable there. The, the origin of the form is that perspectival shape mm -hmm. of the and they're fabricated out of neodymium. Uh, David likes to call it neodymium or whatever. Neodymium. I don't know. Diamond. I don't know. <laughs> um, and it's uh, kind of flat. It's, it's used in making magnets, as I understand. But mm. what we'll see as we go over here is that the color of it is dependent on where right. it is in relationship to the light, which is another kind of overarching theme that, that you know, I was hoping to get out in this show, which is kind of a um, the line between or exploring, um, you know, when is something a picture and when is something, when is something just a, an element and in an installation? Um, and all of these pieces, the work in this show was kind of hovering on the line both and in the the really great piece that you wrote for the Brooklyn Rail about this in the nice. beginning of it you're talking about when you were working as a guard at MoMA and yeah. the moment when the lights go out yes and, oh you know it's is it a work is it a work of art when the lights go out yeah um, and yeah. that was also huge. about um yeah and that's like Another thing that you talked about in the piece was, in, I guess you, you 
you've written about it before was in the Francis Bacon pieces where the, yes. the glass was over them, which was something until I read your article, I really didn't know. I was always wondering, what, what's that about? Um, because there's this kind of interference in yeah. it. And it's like, oh, that was actually, that was intentional and deliberate. David, should we go look yeah, at your go, code, go yeah, sure. in relation to that? Um, and I, I think kind of, you know, in my work, which just a second on that, you know, yeah. you know, <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, is kind of, well, there was a, a book of collection of new narrative writing that came out some time ago. It's called the it's called Biting the Error. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea that you know, this thing that I always worried about in my work, especially when I was doing things or photo stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's supposed to be behind glass, and it's like, oh, the glass is interfering. It's like, what if you make that actually yeah. the issue in the work? And that's like, in, in my work, there's always a question of what is the piece itself? What is the, the lighting condition of the gallery? What is the role of the, the viewer in yeah. that? David talks about the, yeah, for code minimalism. The way that I think of it is in, I think everybody in this show does something that could be kind of called a special effect. But the special effects are always really, they're really subtle. And they're mm -hmm. not intended to like, oh, wow. Oh, um, I mean, Jay talking about her work the other day, is, you know, said she wants to make work this. Um, Jay can actually tell us anti non spectacular, anti spectacular, the opposite of that. So we're not, you know, not trying to like wow people, but bring them into kind of subtle, subtle distinctions that the viewer is invited to make or to question about what they are seeing. Um, it's dark out now, but during the afternoon, if you come in here in the gallery, there'll be light coming through the amazing windows. Are we showing the windows yet? Because those are really important. It's, it's, the windows are part of the show too, um, where it becomes questionable whether what you're seeing is the light on the wall that is, that is first of all, it's a picture of a wall on a wall, so that becomes interesting. But then there's a representation of light within it that, um, that there's a kind of perfect moment for me, at least this is my take, and maybe she has a different take, where well, it's the cipher, and I just yammed on, so it, it, it gets like that. Well, I also, I also thought of Duchamp a lot because Duchamp, there's a couple people like Smithson was obsessed with mirrors and, um, and obsessed and obsessed with boxes and his non-sites were sort of like um, Don, Donald Judge with rocks in them, you know, and, um, but with Duchamp, um, and you mentioned Francis Bacon, another totally unfashionable um, you know, um, an unfashionable figure in this show. I, I thought that he wanted, when I would look at his work earlier, I thought it had to do with kind of um, French design or, you know, um, Upper East Side sensibilities in the 60s, you know, but I really did think it would be like Duchamp really recognized that the public would be reflected in his glasses. And that's why he called them hilarious pictures because he assumed people would laugh. But I think that um, with Francis Bacon, he, I think he provided us or provided me with this kind of Dorian Gray moment where we look into, we see ourselves reflected in the surface of Bacon's paintings and we're sort of mildly terrified about this. And Duchamp also with, um, I, I was really aware because I taught, I lectured on Cornell in my uh, Joseph Cornell in my um, history class at SVA. And I became aware that both Johns and Rauschenberg viewed Cornell as the origins of pop art, and uh, which I agree with. But um, Cornell also made a film that Gwen Thomas was in uh, in 1957. And uh, it's, a, it's a very lyrical film. Not, it doesn't make you, it's not claustrophobic, it's very beautiful very lyrical. And um, I thought that that here, I could not remove my thinking of Cornell and Duchamp's work, particularly his piece, Fresh Widow, uh, which is a pun on French widow, which was like a, 
a kind of frame, a, 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 a window with black leather as the panes that had to be polished. I cannot dissociate, dissociate that from um, Gwen Thomas's beautifully crafted and deeply uncanny works and the level of craft that you know one sees in them in in, in um in service to an idea as duchamp would say was, was really astonishing to me and really a treat there's somebody in it now we're in a window and i'm talking to you in a window so there's um the kind of pure photographic experience of the show um really 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 hit me um jay's work also looks like if we are on the inside of a camera, it looks like the indexical marks of light on film within a camera. And so I did feel I was walking around this kind of a camera obscura, which made me a little sad because my friend Barbara S died last year and, and she used the pinhole camera. And also we've seen a lot of this revival of the camera obscura in contemporary art with Zoe Leonard, um, this guy, Nick Relf, who I, uh, British artist, and also um, an ex-student of mine, um, Corinne Jones, did a, a, a work um, with Camera Obscura this summer on the Lower East Side. So we're seeing, we somehow really desire this in this digital age, we're talking back and forth with, we're, we're desiring this pure optic experience, which a lot of the works of the show gave me. And, and uh, with, um, with your work, Roberta, I really, I did think of this, this kind of sentimental performative window space as this transitional space between in and out. But also, um, I also remember this very obscure work by Jack Goldstein, who um, um, hits a lot of points in the show of that he made this window with a kind of film of a dawn or a fire kind of pulsing outside the window. It was shown at the Jewish Museum a few years ago. So it was great in this very modest show to have all these things pouring back to me and particularly my memory as a guard and particularly um, during that period reading voraciously Lucy Lepard's Five Years, which Kenneth McShine, my um, mentor at SVA had lent me. So um, being there was, was sort of wonderful. But then again, as, as David and I were talking, we're all kind of giddy for art these days. Whenever I come to look at something or go to a gallery, I'm really post-pandemic living in Connecticut. I come in to see Tessa De Dean's show or the Francesca Woodman show at Marion Goodman, and I fall in love, you know? And, um, and I think that's sort of like post-pandemic giddiness. And I was reading Art Forum, which I still subscribe to, and I see it in like, you know, um, um, Amy Silman's piece on Cezanne and, and this performance artist that does this punk stuff that everyone loves. And, uh, and everyone loves it. There's this kind of, we're, we're all getting ourselves over to this. So, um, and to see Ethan Ryman's work was really, when I got back, I wrote the piece about it being signage kind of Charles Sheeler-esque precisionist signage. But I also thought of someone, another un unfashionable artist, British artist, which was Richard Hamilton, and um, who um, whose work didn't travel the Atlantic that well. Although I don't know why, some British art did, we know, we know who they are. And some British art did not, and he didn't, but I think, it really reminded me of this kind of seamless design. And as I was looking for it, I was thinking of the, the shape in the left-hand corner as kind of a suspended platform. And I think that Hamilton dealt with this kind of as his obsession with design, manufacture, and, and polished products. So it was a real, it was a real treat to see it. And also, I believe I was in a show with Ethan that this wonderful um, curator, um, Jay Nosfer, Sarah Sabanagajlu, a uh, young Turkish curator did about 10 years ago in Brooklyn. And it re reminded me of that. So yeah. I, I was overwhelmed with good things. I just another point, you know, with Ethan's work is there's a lot of the work here, um, you know, maybe uh, changes, maybe my work um, is kind of an exploration of an edge, which seems that seems it refers to you know, they're technically, I guess, the photographs, but he calls them paintings. And some of the work is on that 
seems to me on that sort of edge between photography and painting, mm -hmm. which is exactly what you were talking about, about camera obscura. I mean, I think there's a, just a big exploration and an importance to just question what, you know, what it, the, the kind of taken for granted about, you know, what photography is, you know, now that, you know, we don't, we can print on all kinds of things, you know, just getting away from the taken for granted of printing yeah. on a photo paper or even on a, you know, two-dimensional surface. But Ethan is doing this thing in a gloomy way um, with this edge between sculpture and photography. So I, yeah. think, you, I, know, I just don't know what other people are here will be able to see and know. He starts by making these models, um, just wood, wood and, and acrylic paint. Mm. They exist in the third dimension, you know, obviously third dimensional um, dioramas, I guess you call them, and then bringing them into 2D by photographing them mm -hmm. and then bringing them back into the third 3D with mm -hmm. this levered um, installation. Here, so it's everything is just pointing toward, you know, kind of shaking you, not in a, you know, hopefully in a very unfashionable way, shaking mm -hmm. you out of kind of um, just, oh, I know what it is because I've seen it a million times before and I've coded it. And mm -hmm. this is this is a door, this is the floor. And um, there's a resistance to that that makes yeah. sense. That's what yeah. you're talking about. I think to me also, it was a totally pictorial show. I did not really differentiate between flat things on a wall, uh, prints on a wall, Ethan's, Ethan's work, uh, Gwen's work. And um, to me, they were all pictures. And, um, and there wasn't this, you know, categorization between a painted object and, um, and, um, a flat thing on a wall, which really interested me. In the 80s, we yeah. saw, yeah, I love this picture, yeah. I, we talked a lot about the occult and the occult is something that, that kind of is, dances around the fringe of, of this show, kind of mm -hmm. like, um, and um, I really did think of my Irish grandparents turning mirrors to the walls after someone died in the house to, so the spirit wouldn't, be involved with the mirror and be distracted for ascending. And um, and then I thought of Blade Runner, but I didn't want to uh, mention Blade Runner because I at SVA I talked about it too much and everything goes back to Blade Runner. But I thought if I was a spirit, um, this would be a wonderful exotic kind of world to live in. This picture and also the surface peeling um, peeling away from it, I thought was really really glamorous, which is a word I don't use too much, but what the, what the hell, I'm 70 now. Yeah, and, um, and it was um, um, really aesthetically, really, really pleasing, very painterly and different than other things um, in, in the show. And um, also in relation to like Jay's work and to your work, Roberta, I did think of um, Warhol's shadows uh, shadow works throughout the show, sort of later because I had seen them at Dia. I had, um, I went to the, my, my wife and I went to the opening and Andy signed an interview for us. And, um, but, but still as works, they are extremely potent things. These huge absence and presence nonsense that photography harps on. And um, they kind of got away with that. And, um, and I thought the absence and presence conundrum, the hot potato Zen cone, was sort of absent throughout the show. You know, it was a but whole. There's, there's a point, I think you know, kind of the absence, and even just you know, the, you know, of a white wall or with Jay's work, or just maybe a moment for what's going on with as he says. Well, there was she's shooting through to make this fabrication, shooting through plastic, and this is just mm -hmm. through paper and chrome. There's a there's a window, there's a mirror, there's a door, but it all becomes just finding this, allowing this space for mystery in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, we printing it, we printing it on uh, um, a polyester satin. Right. Um, and there's an effect where um, there's a reflection that happens in the work where you're 
not sure whether it's again whether as a distinction yeah. or um, representation or just the light in the piece itself. And it's that kind of moment not knowing that kind of opens it to you know maybe to the occult. Yeah. I, I think of like some of sort of like very kind of mild mannered ghosts or something. Yeah. Now, these aren't like the you know the scary scary ghosts, but yeah, it's just because we're normally you know New York is not you know I think there are tons of ghosts in New York, but it's so yep. you know busy and noisy here. You know who's gonna people don't pay attention. Yeah. But, um, no, a no, number of artists. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I think that I think that um I think art haunts the gallery it's in. I think that one of the things about I would notice particularly about being a guard, but also going, I think galleries are haunted by the art that preceded the show you're in. If you're following, if you're lucky enough to follow um, um, Sophie Cowell at, at a gallery, or if you're lucky enough to follow um, um, Donald Judd at a gallery, your, your work is haunted by that work. And um, I've, in the late 80s, I became really interested in the paranormal. And um, I got my own work and, if, and I was interested in the paranormal because um, I had nothing else to be interested in and no one wanted my work anyway. And that's what I always was really interested in. So I decided to let do it. And I did a lot of work with um, um, ESP and uh, stuff like that. And it got really well known. So the thing that I thought was the most marginal of my thinking got me the most attention and in the most collections and stuff. This, this image right now is really beautiful with this kind of suprematist square on the wall. And then these beautiful kind of Flemish tiles of minimal works, these gorgeous absences that um, I think um, um, Shinju's work uh, sort of was to me. They really reminded me of Flemish tile. And um, I think they're the compact ability of the show itself uh, to roll up under your arm and take it away is really radical. That's something I don't feel too often that the kind of scale of it, it feels really radical to me as opposed to the gargantuan jumbo scale of the galleries we all know and love. So uh, I, I really like the idea that we could sort of roll everything up. Are you actually jumbo scale? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I think I'd like to see everybody at the jumbo scale, but I think we don't need it here. In the 70s, when there wasn't really an art market, there was conceptual and narrative art was very portable. Um, it was really a 30 by 40 inch photograph was a huge piece. That was a real big deal. And then in the 80s uh, with the photo object, um, a neglected artist who I talk to all the time is my friend Jennifer Belande, who um, kind of made this hybrid photo and sculpture objects that was very influenced by critical theory at the time and cinema theory, which is the only one I ever got really. And um, um, her work is being revived now and being seen more. And I thought of Jenny's work a lot in this show. Uh, I, I hope she tuned in, but. Um, She's in uh, Joshua Tree. And, uh, but there was in the 80s, this hybrid of it. And then the 90s, it sort of disappeared a bit with a few other things. And now, um, and now it sort of came back, uh, I think with the show that um, Carol Squires did at the ICP in 2014, um, that involved like manual processes. In, in my teaching, kids, my students love to make prints. They liked water. They liked the dark room. They liked the, the noise of the, the sexiness of the click of the camera. Um, that's all been absent in the digital. The digital has exited water. The digital has exited the sexy click of the camera. So um, there's a real nostalgia for that. But there was nothing, nothing nostalgic about anything in the show. You know, it seemed very fresh and very purifying to me. Oh, like you. looking through a crystal. Um, yeah, well, it's also your, your work. Oh, David. Oh, um, yeah, I think we're, are we ready for that? No, when you're on the just think about it. Well, just one more thing. I wanted to talk a little bit or maybe ask you about, because I certainly think there's a relevance to your work, um, you know, with the hotel motel rooms and that mm -hmm. sense 
haunting and presence and you know walls yeah. you know, pictures pictures of walls on the walls and also yeah. just going back to to Jay's work um I just want to mention that something that you might not see in this digital representation which is how most people are seeing it is that there's the residue or the remnant of these are studios different studios right. Been in, which is something Elisa also does, and it's relevant in Singe's work too, where there's the traces of the people who have been there before, or of their work, um, or of their effort, and um, yeah, making that uh, again like the conditions of the making of the work being um, inseparable from from what the work is. Yeah, it, the studio the studio becomes the work and it kind of, this transfer happens where the walls of the studio become walls elsewhere. This kind of transference of walls, which minimal art in, in Lucy Lepard's book, Five Years, there's this photograph of this um, artist named William Anastasi who taught at SVA when I was there. And it's a kind of a weird work because it's really great and then, like a lot of artists, he did lots of different things very quickly. And so, um, but he made these huge photographs of the walls of the gallery that um, would would host the photo that would host the art. He would go to the gallery, take the photographs, sort of like Louise Lawler in a sense. Louise Lawler would her first show at Metro Pictures uptown was photographs of the. Um, um, the walls of the space that Metro Pictures was going to occupy. And I think I think Jay's work is in sequence to that um, a lot, you know, and um, and there's a real, um, I think Mel Bachner, this other conceptual artist who, by the way, did not like Lucy Lepard's Five Years book, uh, um, talked about the, the kind of the studio as a place for meditation, where you know, if you go into it and don't do anything for 10 minutes, it's still sort of work. And I bring this to Jay's work whenever I see it. And one other point I wanted to make that I thought of this morning was that everything that's on the wall at, um, at this location seems to be belong on the wall. It's all stuff that should be on the wall anyway. The side effects, the, special effects, the light, uh, even the placement of, of Gwen's work where vents and signs should be over our heads is kind of the space where it's a utilitarian space for vents and exit signs. What's it doing up there? And But it seems to belong there. So everything in the show, uh, Ethan's work um, and uh, Elisa's work seems to be eerily belonging in where it should be in the gallery as a kind of um, light lit room. Um, yeah, yes. I think maybe is it time to see if there are questions from people or if we, if we get, if we're gonna have to try to figure it out technically. Um, so let me let me just allow you to do that. Oh, I get to have the camera now here. Yeah, we can see when these are yeah, photos of windows and we in installed them, you know, at a height that's making this kind of architectural um, reference that I think is, you know, is important. Yeah. Um, going back in here, oh, this is where they're doing the, the tech stuff. Um, <laughs> So, um, yeah. Raise your hands if you got a question, people out there, and all you ghosts, yeah. ghosts yeah. out there in in the digital, in the digital world, full of haunted all, by all kinds of of beings. Yeah. yeah. Any of the artists have anything? There? Any art? Any of the artists in the show? Or any of y'all out there um, that have anything you want to? Questions or, or statements or moments of outrage about what, what we just said. Uh -oh. um, I, I, in the mean, you'll let me know when they do. Just I wanted to say something about what you were saying about um, you know just the meditative space of the studio because it's something that both Sing Singja and Jay talked to me about, which is because Singja is from from China, living in the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. You know, not all that long and a kind of sense of, um, uh, you know, the strangeness and displacement um, 
of that experience. And Jay is someone who lives um, between uh, the United New York and Iceland prim primarily, and is often, you know, in places that are not, um, you know, not, not home. And in different ways, talking about a kind of, you know, the meditative comfort of just looking at the wall. And, uh, you know, thinking about that this morning, it's like, oh, yeah, well, white walls are going to be kind of like that. That's one thing that's staying the same, you know, wherever you yeah. are. And again, opening up to that, um, you know, possibility of of projection or, you know, and or haunting, you know, come yeah. on in. There was um, a really interesting, I think he's still alive, Alan Sarrett. Um, who was a post-minimal artist and musician. And he did this beautiful piece where he drilled a hole in his wall uh, in lower Manhattan in the late sixties and traced the light across his room. And, um, uh, and also the work of Jan Dibbets that um, I think um, I first saw in a show, possibly at Sonnabend in 19, 70 or 71 when I was a student. And it seemed, the thing about this work, it seemed like I could, you could do it. It seemed like with the camera, you could do these things and not need a huge, huge space. And it was portable. And you had this, these pictures, these piles of pictures, which, which I thought were amazing. So um, I, I really did, I really did come out of that you know, um, which was um, leaving. In the 70s, there was no art market. So we thought art would melt away. Like my guard experience, I thought that like the pictures on the wall that we just received, but guess what? It came back uh, in the late 70s. The handmade object came back big time. People wanted handmade things again. And guess what? There was a generation of people that wanted to be art dealers to sell them. So there was this big, no, it, right? there was this big buoyancy and this big uh, thing of it. I saw it happen. I um, I was writing, I had to review a show at Char Charlemagne Palestine, a performer, 30 people attended. But on the way home, I turned to left on Prince Street and there was a David Solly show that was opening and there were like 300 people there and they all knew each other. It was like in 1980 and I thought something is changing. So that the de dematerialization of the art object sort of had a tough time in the 80s when, uh, when the, the painted object came back big time. But I think all the work in this show somehow operates between that. And, exactly. that, is, and that is of great interest to me. Well, that, I'm so glad you said that because that's something I'm so, you know, I'm trying to put words to whatever, but it's neither, you know, there's a kind of, you know, cold, the work in this show is to me not about some kind of, you know, cold and complete, you know, rejection of, you know, the, the valorization of the, of the object, but it's not, you know, it's not, you know, as Jay said, we're, you know, anti, it's anti-spectacular, it's kind mm -hmm. of, kind of a hovering, you know, a hovering, mm -hmm. both a perceptual <laughs> hovering contextual kind of hovering that um you know, that draws me to to all of the people yeah i also there's also another reference i had when i left that i kept out of the review because i was just going on too much was um uh, roy lichtenstein's mirror paintings from the yeah. early 70s which are really masterworks i think i don't use that word too much but they were oval uh they were oval and they had all these effects painted into them all these little lines and shimmers and glints that were made into the objects. They were almost perfect. This perfect marriage of, of photography, reproduction and object into one thing. And they were, and I thought of them a lot with that, uh, that kind of um, Flemish light bulb floating like an idea mm -hmm. up there, you know, and also of the tile like works that had these special effects built into them and also Roberta in your works that had sort of the special effects built into the work already, which um, all the shimmers and all the kind of shifts and glints. So this is not seeing something I'm seeing in painting too much these days. I don't follow painting too much, but, and also this looks and, and the image of um, the hallway in, in San Diego, correct? Santa Monica, but Santa Monica. Santa Monica. Santa Monica. Santa Monica. Santa Monica. well, there's the Navy, and um, 
<laughs> but also it reminds me of these paranormal shows that got really big about 15 years ago, these ghost hunting shows, like, um, mm. which I think got popular during the rise of technology, spiritualism, the occult, and, and the internet, you know, and um, so there was all these, you know, guys that looked like roadies from White Snake going around uh, looking for ghosts uh, in, in basements in Rhode Island, you know, and I think that kind of um, was a balance of the incredible digital thing we're coming through. And I thought of that, particularly in that work of uh, Santa Monica and the hotel. I photographed hotels obsessively. I, some of them are art and some of them are not. But I, so what I, is it? What is it about hotels? Because I, I just love, I love me a hotel room, you know. And I was thinking about that, and maybe after reading your piece, just, you know, wondering whether it's just that that there's the the presence. You know, it's probably if I walked into a brand new hotel room, I mm. might not, you know, feel that. But all of the so many, yeah, so many presences have have been there. This thing of like that, it's you know, it. it, it it's home, but it's not home, you know, yeah. it's safe, safe, but not safe. Yeah, um, you, know, you snap you know, on the TV, you kind of, you know, there's this kind of, there's these histories to it. I think you're just part of this little slot of this kind of series of histories that continues on the next week. And it's sort of this transitional space of rest and then in, it's intense and it's, the, the, like rest the, and unease at the, unease, same, but also, at the same time. But also right. sexu sexuality and privacy and um, all kinds of stuff. I think hotels are, are really complicated. I think we should do more art in them, about them. Oh my God. You totally. know? Can I say something? Yep. Oh, we've got I, I want, can everybody hear me? I, 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 Edward, can you hear me? Gomez in Tokyo. Yes. Edward Gomez in Tokyo. Hey. Hi, Edward. Hello, so Edward, hi. Congratulations. Yeah, I want to jump in too, because Edward wrote a piece for us on the show um, for his uh, new group journal. Is, uh, I don't know how many issues we have out For his new group journal. What public, Edward, can you hear me? I'm hearing you, but it's breaking what up public? a lot. Uh, I'll answer your question. I hope you can sure. hear. Hey, Edward. Hello. Hey, I just I haven't seen you in a long time. I know you're in Tokyo, and I just wanted to thank you for the work that you did. Well, thank and you. I got anything you wanted I, to add or any questions? In 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 the magazine Brute Journal, which uh, which you can find online, Brute Journal one word dot com. I did not review the show because obviously I did not see the show. Instead, I looked at the themes of the work based on an interview, a written interview with Roberta, and with a. Also, in, based on a conversation with David, whose work as a an art dealer and artist, I'm ve I'm very familiar with. So, I invite you to look for that article. And David has been circulating it in the form of a PDF file. So maybe he can send it to those of you who haven't seen it. Um, I appreciate all of your remarks, especially hearing Tim describe all the resonances that he felt in looking at the exhibition in person, to me as a fellow art historian and art critic and curator, it's, it's always very exciting when one can look at a work of art and be, uh, and, and, and be uh, reminded by and through the work of art of all kinds of affinities and relationships, and then to be so excited by those stimulating uh, impressions, ideas, connections, and to want to bring them into the exhibition. And one of the remarks that Tim made, I believe just now, was that this exhibition was small, but very concentrated in, in its impact and its feeling. Even from a distance, even just through my interviews with Roberta and David, I could sense that. I could sense that it was a very focused and concentrated experience of artworks. So congratulations on the selecting of the artworks and in achieving your goal of addressing your theme so, so competently. Well, the last thing I wanna say is that I agree with some of the remarks that the two of you made just a moment ago when you were expressing your satisfaction in, in being able to experience such an exhibition in the gallery right now as at least New York begins to emerge from 
the pandemic. Um, I have not been going out very often out of fear of contagion to see gallery shows. Gallery shows in this part of the world are still very social distance controlled by appointment only for the most part. But I agree with you. It's, it's satisfying to be able to go out and look at exhibitions since that's very much a part of all of our lives. But it's particularly satisfying when you go to see an exhibition that really delivers on its proposed theme. Thank you so much. Yeah, and that can be done, as we've said, with very with a with a small but well chosen, concentrated selection of works, and then sometimes it can be done with, as you know, a much larger sweeping survey of works. So, thank you for even touching upon this theme. It's very interesting. And uh, I wish much success to all the participants. Thank, thank you, you so much. Bert. Thank you for and the- I question. saw Alan, yeah, you got your hand up, Alan. I, I, you should be able to speak. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you hey, um, I'm totally also enjoying this. <laughs> Love all of your references, Tim. Um, I have seen the show and um, really was intrigued by it. So what I wanted to ask Roberta was, um, David mentioned in the introduction that the show began with uh, Shinja's um, comment to you that you were making similar work. And often that triggers this immediate anxiety of influence and is one of those things that can be very um, defeating, you know, for an artist like, uh, I teach and in classrooms sometimes, you know, students present something and then somebody says, oh, it reminds me of so-and-so. And it's taken not as a constructive uh, reference, but, uh, you know, the artist experiences it as, oh, too bad. I thought I was being original. So how did you, um, I mean, I, I think it's fascinating that instead of, um, experiencing that as in some kind of negative way you used it as a springboard into you know sharing an aesthetic and finding others who were sharing that and um i just wondered if you could talk about that because it's such a great positive turnaround well i just i just want to say because i have a, a, another big interest of mine is in how history gets written and rewritten and so forth this i don't think it didn't exactly say that, um, you know, and, and also the reason he came was because you put something on Instagram and he came and, you know, um, we did talk and I was, I was interested in, in seeing what, what he was up to. Um, and I don't know, you know, it's, I'm just kind of thrilled when I feel like, you know, there are other people that are thinking about, you know, the same things that I'm thinking about or, you know, are interested in them because, you know, for the most part, you know, I feel like um, just if it was my life, I'm like a complete weirdo. Um, and, you know, then there's an excitement to just being able to make, you know, make connections. And I was, you know, sort of like, I'm not really sure if these connections are, you know, am I just fantasizing that they're there? And, you know, not until, you know, and big thanks to David and also to Yanka, um, who works here for, for putting, getting it up on the wall so beautifully. It wasn't really until then that I was like, yeah, this actually, there are these kind of connections going on, which, which sort of almost seemed more, you know, there were more connections going on than I had even originally, you know, originally conceptualized. So yeah, I just, I just love that, you know, that there are people who, you know, are kind of, I, I don't want to talk about teams, but, you know, for lack of a better word, you know, are exploring, you know, exploring, people are exploring something together. And there's a sense, you know, that I do feel with this, you know, we, the way we installed it was to not just have it, this artist, that artist, that, to mix it up in a way where it becomes like the ideas, you know, who, who in a way, who gives a fuck who made it? You know, the art world is so much about name, this name, that name, you know, that name is bigger than this other name, you know, and what you know, I'm hoping, you know, I, a little idealistically is that this show brings forth, you know, as if there were kind of a spirit that's jumping between the different works, 
um, that's you know as important as you know the individual like you know oh I made this you know I made that um, that, I, that I answers it. I, I don't think photography is ageist, you know? Whenever I see a photograph uh, and in, a, in a museum, I never look to see how old the person is who made it. I go, wow, that really works, or that's good. With a painting, I tend to like look at the mm -hmm. birth date and go, oh man, you know, like 1964, I bought the Rolling Stones album that year, <laughs> like, or, or worse, you know, 1993, for God's sake. And um, so I, with with painting, I kind of make this connection between this earnest earning this and and with photography with photo based imaging, I I directly like um, you know it doesn't matter um, it's a picture and the picture immediately functions in a number of ways to me and they could be the individual making it could be twenty. Alan, you and I in our teaching see that constantly. It's a it's a tremendous picture that works, or they could be you know, 79 years old, living in Hartford, Connecticut, and it's a, they find it in the basement and it's a knockout. So um, that throughout the show, I immediately related to it on this, on this kind of intergenerational, but I didn't know, you know, they all worked okay. on this kind of conceptual level, which is very rare. Not all, not all group shows. I, I would have to say if, if this had been a situation where like, you know, I'd walked into Singe's, you know, triple show at the you know, Guggenheim moment, you know, and, and the Whitney, you know, while, you know, I was, I might have had a different experience of it. Um, but, you know, but it's not that. And it is like, who, who cares about, you know? And I thought it was really fascinating that there, I immediately saw all these connections between his work and Jay's, you know, two artists who executed at different times from completely different, you know, uh, he's from China, she's from Canada, living in Iceland. Um, you know, they don't know each other at all. Um, but it was like, whoa, the work is there, there's such, it was just, yeah, almost freaky, the kind of mm -hmm. um, uh, relationship between, between the two. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then in talking to them about it, you know, it's not exactly the same, but there's a lot of, you know, a lot of similar, similar issues and concerns, so. Yeah. Um, um, anybody else there? Tim, okay. No, no I'm fine. I, I would just love to hear, love for, to hear from any of the artists in the show. Um, uh, what I wrote was okay, right? I mean, it's okay. Ethan, oh, Ethan really? just- yeah, wonderful. I, I, oh, well, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, thank you so I'm, much. Is that yeah. go ahead? Yes, I'm, yes, thank you so much for the wonderful we, review. Thank and, you, uh, Glenn. Yes, and I there are a lot of- yeah, the things you said that I really appreciated about okay. the whole show and about my work. And uh, I think we did meet with Jean Dupree uh, <laughs> many years ago. A, yeah, we, at the Ear Inn, at the Ear Inn probably. I believe so. Yeah, yeah. he was chef and, there. Yes, yeah, I, he was a I, wonderful, was, wonderful artist. And he did an incredible, man. wonderful man, wonderful artist. And he did a fantastic piece called a Heartbeat, which yes. was with yes. the red dust in yes. a container. Yes. It was incredible. And then he went back to France and lived in Pierrefeu, a little town yes. way up in the mountains. And, uh, but, and then when I was teaching at Parsons, his son was in my class. It was a curious, amazing kind of coincidence. But wow. um, I also that. wanted to say that um, when you said about the vents, about my work being uh, in the show here, um, the uh -huh. long vents, um, curiously enough, I did a series which was an homage to Duchamp in photograms, which were, um, he did a, one photograph, Duchamp, and it was called Piston de Courant d'Air, which means air vent. And it was a photograph of an air vent. And that was his one photograph, which he signed. It was a black and white photograph. You can see it in the, his catalog, Raisonne, the Schwartz. Uh, uh -huh. you know, it's there, one photograph. And I did a whole series of, in homage to that piece which was, yes, of an air vent. He signed it in blue ink on the front. Wow. And, um, you know, so anyway, that's another coincidence there. Just yeah. and that you mentioned that, thank you. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. It's such a, a treat to hear your voice. Uh, this is kind of what, you know, what the art world does best when it does it, I think, you know, this kind of connection. Yeah. Um, yes. 
Well, I'm, I'm really, really pleased about this. I, I think um, also someone I thought of, which is, is Neil Jenny, you know, also who yes. makes these, yes. these elaborate frames. And it's a whole yes. other area. It's a whole other bad painting area. But I also, I've also thought of the craftsmanship and, um, and, um, and I thought of Duchamp a lot uh, throughout the show and he's in and out of fashion. And I know that a lot of the minimal artists and the post-minimal artists like like um like Robert Smithson and, and all that team, they didn't like him. They didn't they didn't like the occult side and they didn't like the chess playing side and oh, made okay. some comment like, you know, it's it's like has all this, you know, monarchist and it, you know, all these monarchist relationships with chess mm -hmm. and this and this. But mm -hmm. I thought of it a lot. I thought of it in Roberta's work, and I thought of this this picture that that holds you and pulls you into another dimension. There's there's a book by an author named Peter Gay, who's it's not a good book, but one of the characters in it is a schizophrenic um, museum guard who feels that the, the pictures he can walk in and, and converse with them in a museum in Britain, in Great Britain, and that part of it certainly re I related to it, but. Um, I thought the show was, I felt I could fall into sort of like Alice in the Look Looking Glass, mm -hmm. like, like a Lewis Carroll character, I could fall backwards into basically every work in the show. Oh, and I'd be happy there, yeah. I think. I'm not sure, but we'd find yeah. out. But what a treat, Ben, what yeah. a pleasure. What pleasure also. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. So any of the other yeah. artists out there have anything? I'd love to hear, hear from you all. I, we're not we're not creating any oh it's ethan hi i don't know if you can you hear me um <laughs> I would, uh, well first of all i think i should take this opportunity because it's probably my my only opportunity to correct tim mall on anything um but the lepard the lepard uh, uh dematerialization book is is six years not five oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> i figured i should take my opportunity when it arises um also, I just wanted to say that um, it, you know the 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 meeting of these artists is is fascinating to me because it, it's a reminder that um, that you know we're all thinking about things that have been thought about uh, for a long, long time. Uh, you know, you mentioned Ralston Crawford. Um, you know, uh, there's Paul Strand. There's you know I don't know. There's an endless uh, you know sort of early. Um, photographer painter guys who who were thinking about these things uh -huh. and this show brings together a lot of artists that are um are are, are thinking about uh, you know sort of very basic things about how we how we look at things and, and how we perceive them and what's important and what's not and uh and i love i love that aspect of the show and i and it's also interesting that that you know we've all sort of you know uh, we have connections you know i've shown with tim uh, i've shown with gwen i've shown with <laughs> <laughs> with, with a lot of these artists in uh, in different contexts, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Sarah Subonguago's show at the convent. I mean, that was sort of my first outing, and um, there's a lot of work. I, I, I find that a, a very interesting aspect of the show. You know, when I look at Eliza's uh, print on uh, on on um, on silk uh, and and the the composition. And the relation between the composition and what it's made of and how it was conceived, uh, and its relation to composition in general, which is associated to painting and you know everything else, um, you know that's just an example of of all the different ways that we can be contemplating these things and all of the valid um, and interesting ways of of uh, approaching these problems and making the work and getting it on the wall in various ways and how it transitions from the work to the wall to the space and how it relates to you know how we look at things and um uh, that that for me is the real beauty of the show uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's a sort of conglomeration of all these uh, wonderful aspects uh, that are well worn you know this is a this is a road that has <laughs> been we've been going down this road for a long time and it's beautiful. I know. <laughs> it's beautiful to see uh artists you know, uh, innovate uh, mm -hmm. on, on a very well traveled path. Yeah, yeah no, I agree. I, I I was really excited by it, and um, I um, yeah, I no, I was kind of overwhelmed with with particularly um, biographical things, which I don't normally get overwhelmed with when um, 
when I look at art, unless I, you know, go to something that has something of my own in it. But um, yeah, I was really overwhelmed by that. And I really did have this kind of feeling of, of being a guard again and, uh, and guarding all this work and then watching it kind of die, watching it kind of die. And, um, and the kind of history of, and I thought, well, that's why all these minimal artists were guards. That's how they learned about art. And uh, um, someone should write a book. <laughs> Not me, but uh, uh, you know, it, it was wonderful. We're down on the floor here because we had to, to plug in to get power. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, it's yeah, you know, improvising and, and making the most of you know what the of what the situation is. So, anybody um, else have something? Anybody else have something? Am I echoing? Well, it's great to meet you, Ethan. You too. <laughs> the the other artists, the other artists. Are you the, are you guys there? Jay, are you there? Jay in Iceland. Jay in Iceland. On the spot. Jay in Iceland. Do we, do we have Iceland? Do you have ice on very expensive hands? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Would she lose her connection? No, no. no. But she and Tim are there. Um, yeah. Um, Jay, did my mention of the Warhol shadows um, connect with you at all? Was that okay? Or um, Yeah, definitely it was okay. It's certainly, it's not, um, you know, a... Uh, I don't look a lot at painting, I have to uh -huh. confess. Uh -huh. I don't think about painting, you know, um, I do a lot of watercolors uh -huh. um, that are almost more photographic than they are uh, painterly. But if you're gonna make a reference to any painting, I think that was a very good one. <laughs> Appreciated it. Okay, phew, because um, I thought also the grain of them, but also their inscrutability. And, um, and you know, part of the two, one of the big ghosts of this show, another two was, of course, Vermeer, you know, we, we know him, and also Richter, you know, Gerhard Richter throughout it. Um, and also I thought of, you know, the kind of um, glass um, experiments of like, uh, not experiments, but basing a career like Dan Graham about reflections and um, and the spectacularization of the reflection like in, in Dan Graham's worth and also in Richter's glass and mirror pieces. I thought of that particularly with your work. Your work really, I felt like, you know, that the, that the spaces, windows and your work were this connected by the dots sort of connection within a camera obscura, you know, and, um, everything that was imported into this space does, you know, really belong to be in it. It didn't look like it is imported into the space at all. Your works did not look like they were imported from somewhere else. They looked like the other side of the room and they conversed so well with um, Roberta's work on the other side of the room. And there were all these sort of little marriages made throughout the show that I think Roberta, did so beautifully and uh, not easy, I don't think. Um, small, intense little shows like this, I think are really hard to do, you know? So, but it was a real pleasure to see them. And I did think of Iceland, you know, that light up there. Although this this was, was this the studio that you photographed them in here or in, in, in America? One of them was in Iceland and one and okay. two were, in in the states but i agree with you i think it's it's um my only regret is that i haven't been able to see it live and in, in yeah. i agree with you that it's a very uh challenging show to pull off and pull off well because mm -hmm. you know the subtle distinctions between um uh, some of the works and uh i think how it was hung um i love the fact that the light changes in the space on the work itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and it responds to that where normally it's a hindrance. I also thought in your work, a lot of sound. I'm, um, I thought of, um, you know, when I did see the Richter 
um, concentration campaignings that were at the Met a couple summers ago, about a month after my brother died, um, I thought of industrial music. I thought of, you know, not Sonic Youth as much, but I did think of the music that probably he was exposed to through Isaac Gadkin in the 80s. And I, with your work and a number of the works in the show, I thought of I thought of sound. I thought of this kind of granular movement of sound from left and right across the room a lot. And I don't do that too often. You know, the last time I had done it was at the Richter show. And the second time I had done it was was here at Cat House proper. Looking at your work, I thought this there's a sonic dimension to your work here, you know, and I found that throughout the show. Interesting. Yeah, I'm, I've always been a big fan of, of uh, I'm sorry, I'm on med, so I'm not super clear, oh, but um, the, me too. Uh, I'm sitting in, I'm sitting in a room, Alvin, you know, Lucier, Alvin, Alvin Lucier. Yeah, one of my the great, sound the great. Yeah, yeah, um, I felt that, and then, Richter did work about cage music recently, I guess in the last 20 years, but um, it's very rare that sound comes to mind. I, I'm old, so I listened to like Brian Eno, who, who's, you know, who's, you know, sound, whose visual works aren't as interesting as um, at all as, as his, his sound works are. But I thought, you know, um, if we made a compilation CD of music for this show, uh, Roberta, that um, any one of the artists said it could be on the cover, you know, or let's, it would let's be, do it. I think we can have like. I think it's. I think covers. it's a good idea. You know. I mean. I. I don't know. I'm not a sound person. Ethan is. I think. But uh, um, I. I thought of sound a lot moving throughout it, and like I said, it's rare that I. The previous show I had seen was the Francesca Woodman show, and I didn't think of sound there except maybe Nick Drake. <laughs> sad, sad people that aren't around for too long. But uh, um, I thought of that with your work a lot, so I hope it was appropriate to say so. I'm gonna work on the soundtrack. I'm sorry, is 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 Singja there by any chance? Just give him a wave or something. Maybe yes, not. I'm here. Oh, oh wow. hi. <laughs> Just, hi. How's it land? It's good. It's I'm so glad. It's so warm here, and it's still bright outside right now. It's, um, it's you're, you're in a hotel room ex yes I, I i'm in a hotel room and does it feel I, spooky at all uh not really i mean i enjoy that the space and how the lighting is different in the environment and i just t t like taking have been taking a lot of photos with my phone it's just i'm thinking oh well maybe it can be my next body of work but another the, hotel room <laughs> yeah i I think I do have a lot of photos that I just took in a hotel room because in like uh, in, you know that a uh, lot of my work is just an uh, empty space, empty wall and how light and shadow on the surface. So I, I just constantly like collecting a lot of photos. Um, maybe like 90% photo wouldn't eventually made it to become my work, but it's just like, a, like keep them in stock and just keep collecting. And- Is there Rant that's just for like paying to go to different hotels to, to <laughs> photograph the rooms. I think we could do like a little group group application here, but yeah. Well, that's I don't know. I mean, not all. I mean, every once in a while, art consultants put really good, you know, art in hotels. You know, we've all been in hotels where there's art. Some of it is not that great, but others of it, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's some of it that would be so naturally good there. I think that um, Warhol's sunsets, um, the, these really beautiful sunset images were, I think, commissioned for a hotel, a series of hotels in the late 60s, early 70s. I'm not sure, but I'd sure like one, you know. Uh, if I were the next hotel arrived and I'd like a Warhol sunset in mine. And I'd also like one of yours, you know, I think your work's extraordinary. It was just, um, it was really intense, but just everything, everything seemed to be fastened into it. All the effects and everything that went on outside the work was also going on inside the work. So, and the light in it seemed very, very old. That was another thing I'd like to mention throughout the show, the light, 
in everyone's work seems sort of ancient, you know, although it's a contemporary designed, recently designed and recently, you know, made in the last five years, 10 years space, but the light in it seemed to be transferred from someplace else. It's very emotional for me. So what a Thank pleasure. Thank you for saying that. You know, I never thought of that, but you're saying that it's ringing. It's ringing so true. It's so true. Um, you know, and maybe that's, you know, that's the, the era that we're in is, you know, the, the return of old light or something. Yeah. Um, we're kind of running out of uh, out of battery. Oh, no, we, or, we got three cameras here. We can okay, switch. we can well, all switch. Okay, okay, because um, I just needed to, to check on that, um, that tech thing. Um, but yeah, any other uh, thoughts or questions or, or comments from out there, or, or Tim or Ed, or anyone wants to say something? All right. Yeah. Well, um, before, I don't know if I'll ever hear from anyone again. I hope so. <laughs> let's all, but, you know, let's please, let's, it was one of the, you know, pleasures of, of this, um, when I started writing criticism in the 70s, I, I, I started because I wanted to crack the galleries. I thought if you write, everyone behind the desk is really nice to you. They know it and they know you and then you come back in and then they kind of recognize you. They always used to think I was Tom Lawson for some reason. And, um, and it's a way of entry and every artist I knew who I respected like Robert Smithson, or many other people um, wrote and wrote really well. And, um, and so that doesn't happen all the time. And the, the, right, the relationship with critics shifts with the art world, but something like this for me is, it is just extraordinary. And, and um, being in contact with the artists in the show and everyone tuning in tonight is just is such a treat and, and really profound, I think. I want to thank you for hey, uh, thank yeah. you. Hey, Lisa, uh, Lisa. Hi. Oh, Lisa. Hello. I just spotlighted you from uh, Torino. Oh, wow. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, yeah. hello. Well, thank you very much, Tim, for all your reflections and uh, Roberta for curating the show and everybody and David. It's been a really very interesting and fantastic experience thank you so much yeah and, thanks for and by the way i photographed a lot of hotel rooms too. <laughs> I <laughs> bet you did. Yeah. about 20 years ago for for a few years so um, Me too. I, there's a publication here someplace somebody yeah. should, you know yeah. if not you know let's you know somebody should do it yeah um, well, um, but it was really, really, I really enjoyed seeing your work. And um, uh, one of the things that um, in the 70s, uh, I had a show in Torino and I had, I would go to Northern Italy a lot. I wrote for Flash. In Torino, Art. you showed. Yeah. 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 Ah, that's so, where I am uh, at the moment. That's where yeah, I'm based. A kind of skept dubious art dealer, Nick, but I won't name him. But um, one of the big things that we were trying to do was figure out a way for, the printed image to be on canvas and um, so that it would be sustained on canvas. John Boldessari in the late 60s sensitized canvas, projected pictures on them, but they didn't hold. They would hold for three or four years and they'd shift color. Yeah. And then I think in the 80s, it became like, like the Coons sex ones were like actually images on canvas and the quality got better. But um, I think what you did was sort of really like it looked like the most beautiful you know apparel or clothing or um well or, it actually it is a, a print for yeah. um clothes yeah. it's it's yeah. fabric used for clothes and and now with the with the digital printing it's very easy to have yeah. just a few meters printed it's yeah uh, it's amazing it was such a struggle in the 70s because um people wanted to figure out a way to you know, art dealers would want something beyond a photograph to sell from body artists, from conceptual artists, and it didn't, the canvas did not hold the image for a while. For me, the, the interest end. was uh, not so much of having a, like a, a fabric, like a canvas in order for the work to feel more like a painting. It was the fact of having the, the piece off the wall, like one centimeter. So 
it could wave when someone um, walk, uh, walks past. Mm -hmm. So somehow the subject matter of the photograph uh, relates to the, um, to the material it is printed on. So there is a correspondence between this sheet of plastic that I photographed and like the sheet of um, polyester I've printed. Well, I thought it was really beautiful. And it also did not, um, I referred to the show at the ICP uh, 2014 that um, Carol Squires did. And it, to me, it was also the kind of return of Rauschenbergia, Rauschenberg's Hoarfrost series, where these beautiful, beautiful prints mm -hmm. on, on cloth. But the thing I liked about um, Roberta's project was it didn't, refer back to, to Rauschenberg or Sigmar oh. Polka or, or that, and Rauschenberg's work is so beautiful, but it didn't refer back to that. It seemed very much in the present, all of it. Although there is this age range of the artists in it, it all, everything sort of seemed in the, the very present. And um, I didn't, in that, in that work, um, in your work, it just seemed really new and, and really cinematic <laughs> somehow. Thank somehow you. And I think, I agree that Roberta did an amazing job uh, putting us all together. So oh, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. Well, um, we, have, we have a question from Douglas. Uh, to clarify. Uh, I have to turn my mic on. Um, um, we have a question from Douglas Schwass, who was the artist that uh, had the last solo show here uh, about a uh, question. What was the artist? Who was the French artist you mentioned, Tim, knowing in common who uh, returned to France? Gwen and Tim. Uh, Jean, Jean, Dupuy. Dupuy. Jean Dupuy was um, a Frenchman living in New York. He was a, he was sort of aligned to the art and technology movement. Mm -hmm. He showed he had a big career in New York. In fact, he showed at Sonnabend. He showed at Marion Goodman Gallery very early. He hated it. He um, sort of became a proto relational aesthetic person. He had an authentic engagement, and I think Gwen will agree with the community below 14th Street. It's all he believed in. Um, he did a work, a community-based performance called Soup and Tart, where he made soup and apple tarts for hundreds of people at the kitchen, uh, the, the alternative space, the media-based kitchen, and everyone did a one-minute performance uh, for, their, for their supper. I believe Glenn, it was 70, 71. I was a student of his then, and I assisted him at Son event. And um, he died last year, and he became more and more related to the Fluxus movement. But he is super important in terms of people like Laurie Anderson, uh, Richard Prince, who's doing pretty well, I hear, uh, and many others myself have really valued from our contact with Jean. He's kind of one of the great secrets of um, um, downtown. And I think um, his work can be seen through the Emily Harvey Foundation in Lower Broadway. And um, people are writing like me, I I'm going to Paris in March and I'm having a show, but also I'm going to do some work about Jean there because his work is so important. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I really, once you start digging with Jean, he connects so many people together and, uh, and uh, I really miss him. I talked to him every few months and he was a dear friend of both Kathleen and I. So uh, he would produce works at his loft on Lower Broadway. One was um, a work where he covered the lo loft in, in canvas chambers and he would have a peephole into each chamber and inside a chamber would be Laurie Anderson playing a violin or Nam June Paik or me or um, many, many other, Keith Haring, uh, many other people that he had a real instinct towards, an authentic instinct towards, and not only artists, but other people as well. Sean is a fascinating character in um, lower Manhattan history. It wouldn't have been the same without him. I, you think so, Gwen? Yes, I agree. I yeah. was in a cooking class he had. Oh boy. I, yes, and it was wonderful. Learned how to make uh, very, very thin crepes. I bet. And, and there were only eight of us in the class. And after we made the dinner, after we cooked, we got to invite a friend to join. So then it was a dinner, a little dinner party afterwards. 
with everything we'd um, cooked together, basically. Yeah, it was a lot John of fun. Was, the, it was wonderful, yes. He was the first authentic Bohemian I ever met. Uh, mm -hmm. I was a student of his in 70 or 71, and mm -hmm. he, um, um, he'd take me to look art and we trade, I would take photographs for him and we would trade things and we became very, very close. He took me to see a Piero Manzoni show at Sonnevent. Mm -hmm. And um, it was the only time I ever saw him in Sonnevent happy, <laughs> although he had a show there himself. But uh, he, he was an amazing character. And um, mm -hmm. his partner, Olga Adorno, mm -hmm. was um, married to Billy Kluver and was involved with happenings and events and was all in Jim Dine's events. And she died earlier following Jean. And she was in Warhol's 13 Most Beautiful Women. So there was really my first exposure to hardcore 60s downtown Bohemia. And I sort of haven't been the same. <laughs> I think that's a, good, that's a good answer, right, Douglas? I think you got it. That's very thorough. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Contact um, me. Douglas, contact me and I'll send you something. Yeah, Douglas, uh, he's uh, encyclopedic himself. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. We're going to get cut off from by Zoom itself because I only made the meeting to 630. So uh, we better say our goodbyes. I highlighted all of the, uh, the artists so that we can say thank you to everyone. Roberto, you got to get your... I'm using Roberto's phone because we get feedback. But here's our little like production team. <laughs> here at the gallery Yanka. at Tannhaus Proper at 524 Project. So uh, from Yanka, Roberta, yeah. and myself, and Tim, and all the Thank artists. Thank you so much, Tim. This yeah. was amazing. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you all. And uh, let's let's keep in touch. I have a lot of time on my hands. So. <laughs> and, and Edward, thank you again for writing hey. for uh, Brew Journal. We really Congratulations, everyone. Tim, I would mm -hmm. like to get in touch with you. I'll get in touch with you via David. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, I have. I, I didn't want to steal your thunder, but I also have Jean Dupuis stories and have and spent time with him in his village. I bet. <laughs> I bet. Okay. Well, thank you. I'd, I'd love to exchange. I'll them. put you guys in touch. Great. I'd, 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 I'd like to say. I'd like to say. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear me, but but I'd like to yes. say, uh, Jay, uh, I miss you, and I hope you come back sometime. <laughs> yeah, yeah ditto. You, uh, seeing you all, meeting you, Singsy and Elisa, exchanging studio visits, etc. But yeah, definitely, we'll have to have a uh, retrospective cocktail one of these days to celebrate. Absolutely, the, the best cocktails are retrospective cocktails. <laughs> Some real old cocktails. Thank you, everybody, for um, for tuning in, and thank you, you know, a million times to to the, all the artists of all and David and Yalka. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you next time. Next show is February 5th. What's the next show? The next show is called Cross Cultural Cross. February 5th. It's going to be very dramatic. I hope everybody can check it out. Be there, be square. Okay. Bye. 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 Ciao. Ciao.